So we have a bunch of time for Q&A from, from the audience. So there are two mics over here on the first level that I'm pointing to, and two more mics up on the second level. And so um, if you have questions for, for the audience, come up. Please do introduce yourself. This is probably not the right, even though it is the forum, it's not the right forum to make a statement, uh, just because there's so many people who want to ask questions. So why don't you ask your question and the way you know that you ask a question is that it ends with a question mark. So, uh, so four mics and um, yes. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you so much for, for this opportunity. My name is Chris. I'm a postdoc at the uh, Center for Health Decision Science School of Public Health. Um, we discuss about um, having uh, uh, people paying from, if they're healthy, they, how to get them um, into the, the healthcare pool. Something that we're learning from Indonesia is that instead of giving incentives, like monetary incentive, we're just basically say this is our values and you have to enroll in the healthcare insurance, otherwise you cannot have new IDs, you cannot, um, that's, that's necessary in order to make a drive, uh, renew your driver's license and everything that's civic related. Has there been a discussion <coughs> on that part instead of um, doing economic um, um, incentives? Thank you. So John, I'm gonna hand this to you because it's sort of alternatives to the mandate, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really interesting point. And basically I think what we've learned from the politics of Massachusetts and the ACA is mandate effectiveness is really a social construct. So in Massachusetts, the mandate was much more effective than it's been nationally because in Massachusetts, the law passed unanimously and there was much broader support for the law. Nationally, you had opposition from many corners. You had people, you had states passing laws which did not allow navigators to go out and help people to sign up for health insurance and things like that. So I think the social construct is important. I'm an economist, I think the financial incentives are important too. But I think that the social construct is, is important in which you do this. And, and I think that's something that, you know, I, I think it's a lesson that I think those of us who craft the ACA did not pay enough attention to. And I think it's an important lesson going forward. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Gary Freden. Um, I, I have this very uncomfortable feeling that we're talking about how to finance $10,000 per person per year, which is what healthcare seems to cost these days which is three or $4,000 more than most economists seem to suggest it ought to cost. And I don't think, my question is, can we usefully differentiate financing from service delivery? I think we're talking about doing that, and I don't think that it's a useful differentiation. Uh, I guess my question is, do you agree? <laughs> so I think we've got probably the world's best person to answer that. So Gail has spent a lot of her time and her career thinking about the connection between the financing of healthcare and the actual cost of healthcare, including the price of healthcare, which reflects competition and the, or the lack thereof. Um, so Gail, why don't you, if you heard that question, uh, we'd love yeah, to get your I thoughts. I did, and I actually wanted to go back because it's related to the same issue. Uh, to something that Kate was uh, talking about uh, in her last, uh, the last time she was speaking. I know you don't really mean that it's only about redistribution because we know there are alternative ways of delivering health care uh, and they can have very different costs associated with them. Uh, and of course, there are alternative ways to spend on health care. Uh, using strategies that many countries uh, have adopted, which would be an anathema to the majority of individuals in the United States. This is gonna loop back to the question that was asked. Yes, we could lower spending significantly if we use some of the strategies that other countries have used, where they have tight limits on technology and its distribution. And most of the participants who cost a lot of money, the specialists, the high-tech centers, the imaging, uh, and their distribution are under the control of government. And we were willing to have wages, uh, labor is the bulk of healthcare spending in the United States, 
be at significantly lower levels, uh, not just for physicians, it's not an attack on OVIC, uh, all across the board, uh, nurses, uh, lab techs, uh, everybody involved in the uh, uh, healthcare system. It would, in principle, be possible uh, to deliver healthcare at a lot lower spending. Uh, if you think people in the United States were upset with the concept of a mandate, the government <laughs> telling them what they have to buy, uh, it's hard to imagine the kind of response that would go on in the United States uh, at that kind of proposal, although it's periodically made. So what we need to do in the U.S. is to try to think about ways we can put in incentives to drive efficiency. Uh, and that's what everybody who's up on the stage with you and, and Ovik and myself have tried to think about because for us, getting the incentives and the information out is an alternative way to try to do things that other countries use direct controls to do. Will they be as effective? Well, we obviously have been struggling thus far. But to show you how uninclined we are to do that, think back about where we've been and how we pay physicians under Medicare. In Medicare, for physicians, we did something we don't do elsewhere. That is, we not only had a fee schedule, but we had the fee schedule updates tied to the spending on physicians on, in Medicare. And when it exceeded the growth in the economy, the physicians' rates were to be ratcheted down across the board. <clears throat> But actually, it was only done once in 2003. And then there was so much pushback, not just by the physicians, but by the representatives of seniors, AARP, uh, and the seniors themselves, and others, that we never took advantage of what was a really fail-safe way to limit spending on physicians. Of course, it probably would have had some impact on their access. And it certainly was the fear that it would have uh, impact on their access and maybe some other undesirable characteristics. So for us in this country, we've got to figure out how to do it smarter. And that goes back to some of the demos we were talking about before. Uh, there are a lot of things that don't make sense. We've tried most of them in this country. Uh, and it's time to see whether or not we can't try to harness some of the incentives with better information. The only thing I, I wish uh, Ove had, had spoken about a little more was the need to help everybody with an, that has an HSA so that they have some clue about what things will cost before they experience them and whether or not these are individuals or institutions that are much good, uh, at least pretty good. It is so hard for people to find that information. And even if you have good incentives, if you don't have information to help you choose, which we do in most other parts of our life, it's really tough. I've talked to a number of people with HSAs who are smart. They understand this. Some of them are uh, in healthcare, And they have all bemoaned how incredibly difficult it is to know what the heck you're buying. So we can do it so we slow down spending, but we're going to have to do it in a way that's tolerable, because if it's not politically tolerable in the United States, politicians can't be expected to push it. And even if they try it, they'll be out at the next election. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, up top. Uh, thank you very much for being here. My name is Colin Killick. I'm chair of the Student Disability Justice Caucus here at the Kennedy School. Uh, the Dallas Morning News reported today that Medicaid cuts to Texas's medically dependent children program are already putting the lives of uh, severely disabled children at risk. Is that what we high cost disabled people have to look forward to in this new world of payment reform where programs like uh, home and community based services or dual eligible uh, pro demonstrations might be going away? Avik, do you want to uh, weigh in on, 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 on that? Sure. I mean, you know, one of the big problems, and I'm going to talk broadly, we do address 
uh, disability and how to reform disability coverage in the United States in transcending Obamacare. There are a number of challenges. We could actually spend a whole day, and maybe the JFK Junior Forum should have a whole day or a whole event on, on how, how to reform health coverage for disabilities. But there are a number of challenges, not just that there are cost uh, constraints and overruns and burdens because it is an expensive population to cover. Part of the challenge is that there are people that the def definition of disability has expanded such that disability coverage is being applied not only to people who truly need disability coverage, but to some people who, for whom it's not the appropriate modality for, for covering their health care needs. And as a result of that, the dollars that we allocate to caring for the disabled are being stretched to populations they weren't meant to, to serve. Instead of serving the truly disabled populations, the dollars are really meant for. So th that's one thing we have to try to tackle, and it's very, very difficult to do uh, because of, uh, of, I mean, it's hard enough to reform the health care programs we have already. Disabled uh, disability programs are the hardest of all those to, to, to challenge uh, or, to, or to reform in, in ways that are productive. I think one thing that would be good to do is try to figure out ways to merge the, the various fragmented disability programs we have in Medicare, Medicaid, and other programs in Social Security into a specific program that is designed specifically for disabled populations. Uh, and again, to be much more specific about the precise uh, appropriate levels and, and, and needs of disabled, disabled people and to define what disability means. Because the purpose of, di uh, of disability coverage is to really cover those people who truly can't otherwise do things, uh, the, 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 the everyday uh, uh, life activities that otherwise uh, those of us who aren't disabled are able to do. Uh, and that's something that, uh, that uh, I think we have to actually really do a better job of consolidating and focusing on in order to get the dollars allocated to the right people. John, um, you've also you've done a lot of work on disability, and I know this conversation is about alternatives to the ACA, and we've talked a lot about healthcare. But for a lot of voters, the difference between health insurance and disability insurance is a fuzzy one. You're ultimately trying to smooth consumption. What thoughts do you? How would you respond to the question that was asked? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question, and I think that basically it comes to fundamentally: Are we willing, as a society? to bear the cost of high cost individuals. And I think that the, the question is not, you know, re-engineering programs. I think that's a great idea. We should think about that. But ultimately, I think we have, to, we have to recognize society that some people cost a lot of money to take care of and that we have to ask if we're willing to bear that. And I think that if you look at proposals that alternatives to Obamacare, they don't want to bear that cost. So if we talk about what Ovik's talked about, Okay, I, don't, I can't come back on the litany of points. I've forgotten them already. Okay, but one point was we'll just take the money for Medicaid and we'll give people an HSA with $6,000 in it. The math doesn't work. Okay, right now Medicaid pays providers a lot less. That's why it's cheaper. So if we replace Medicaid with a program where people don't pay any more, that is they pay more than right now it's free, and yet you're gonna pay providers the way they're paid under private insurance, you need magic to make it work. Now, the magic in the modeling that Ovik pointed to is making up things like somehow selling insurance across state lines will save money, which it never has. But the bottom line is we have to recognize some people are more expensive. We have to every, coming to Gail's point, I mean, you know, I, I know Kate understands this. You know, basically there are things, there are better ways to deliver health care. There's no doubt. And there's better ways to deliver care to the disabled. And I think if you want to learn more about thinking about that, there's an excellent proposal out about my colleague David Otter. Uh, who's written an excellent proposal for the Hamilton Project about rethinking disability insurance programs to try to incentivize people to stay at work um, while then helping those people who can't stay at work. I think there's a lot of great things we can do, but none of it's going to work if we're not willing to admit the cross subsidization that has to happen in our society to protect our needest individuals. Thank you so much. I just need to res I just need to respond to that for one. Hey, Ovik, Ovik, Ovik. We've got a bunch of questions, so so we'll, we'll try to bring you in. Yes, at the at down here. 
Hi, uh, my name is Sharon. I'm a junior at the college. Um, I had a question about a critique I've heard of the provision in the ACA that allows young people like myself to stay on their parents' insurance until they're 26. Um, the idea is that this takes a lot of young people who are probably relatively wealthier out of the market to purchase insurance. Um, I was wondering if you guys think that's a valid critique, and if so, um, whether the political popularity, like the political upside of that, is worth the policy drawbacks, and more generally, what are some creative ways to get more young people um, to purchase health care on the exchanges? Yes, Thanks. great question. So, John, do you want to take that? Um, I think that it's mathematically true that if you take 26-year-olds, 25-year-olds, and let them stay in their parents' plan, some of them would otherwise be in the exchange. I think not all of them. I think a lot of them might otherwise be uninsured, and there's evidence, in fact, that Remember, this is a population that's young and healthy and could, in many states, have gotten insurance at a cheap rate in the non-group market beforehand, yet many of them weren't. The best estimates is the expansion to, un to insurance for those staying in their parents' plans up to 26 added about a million, about a million people excuse me, to the insurance rolls. And so I think that it is true if you got rid of that, you would have had some more healthy people in exchanges. I don't think it would be worth it. I think that basically you would have also had more uninsured, and I don't think that's a trade-off worth doing. I also think it's proven to be incredibly politically popular. I mean, mm. we'd love to live in a world without political constraints, but you know, if we look at President Trump said the very first thing he wants to keep is that provision. Uh, I think it's because, as Kate said, people think it's free. When it's not, obviously, it raised the cost of group insurance, and it keeps some healthy people out of the exchanges. But I think the exchanges wouldn't be living and dying on 500,000 25-year-olds. Mm. You know, it's, it, it, that, that, that's not what really matters. The exchanges are, you know, I hate to say, sound controversial, the exchanges are actually doing pretty well, okay? Yes, they're half as big as they thought we thought they were. That's because we thought a bunch of people were gonna leave employer insurance who didn't. That's good news, right? We thought eight million people were gonna leave employer insurance and, because of Obamacare. None did, okay? So that's good news. They're not in the exchange of employer insurance. I see no problem with that. Exchange premiums are higher than we wish they were, but they're growing slower. Over the last three years, they've grown more slowly than they did before Obamacare was passed. So basically, yes, it'd be great to have more young people in the exchanges, and I think we should have a conversation. I think there's some good ideas. You know, Ovik raised some interesting ideas about how we try to get more young people in the exchanges. I think we have that conversation. But I think the one part of Obamacare everybody seems to like is the under 26. I think it's increased insurance coverage. I think it's not doing that much damage to the exchanges. We ought to at least leave that. Great, thank you. Um, yes. Hey there, uh, my name is Sharif Vakili. I'm a MD MBA student at Johns Hopkins in HBS. I have a question that's a, sort of a philosophy policy question that has a direct relevance to whenever we discuss single payer systems. Um, and uh, it relates to, earlier we were talking about, in general we talk about consumers, patients, picking a health plan or picking some type of insurance versus another type of insurance and the amount of flexibility you can have. And I was wondering, and I'd be interested to see with people who have more clinical backgrounds versus not clinical backgrounds in making this, uh, thinking through this, to what extent can people actually fundamentally make an educated decision on what should be provided with their health insurance? For example, can you make a risk-adjusted assessment of your probability to get multiple sclerosis or Crohn's disease for the next 10 years or whether you need to have an x-ray when you're 40 and a smoker or a CAT scan and what should be paid for in a certain insurance and what organ systems might be covered? Or would it make more sense to have that just evidence-based um, and leave that to experts to, or a consortium of people to decide that for a cohort of people and take that decision away from them? Um, and how you think about that tension within healthcare specifically where you may need clinical understanding and expertise to make an informed decision. Okay. So that's a, a, a really good issue to dive into, and I'll be brief because I know there are lots of other people uh, wanting to ask questions. I, I want to go back to what Ovik was saying about low-income people not making any worse choices than everyone else, and I couldn't agree more. I think we all make very limited choices in what healthcare is right for us, where to get the healthcare, what we really need. It's unreasonable to expect patients to be doctors. We just don't have the information that we need to make those choices, which is why a lot of the payment reforms try to enlist physicians and clinicians in helping steer patients towards the care that's right for them. And getting the payment incentives lined up is key for that to happen. Having the providers have some financial stake in 
avoiding care that's of low value for their patients, in steering their patients to the hospitals where they're going to end up getting home and healthy soonest, getting them to the right post-acute site of care. And I'm really glad Gail gave me the opportunity to highlight that I think that these payment issues matter a lot in driving the value of healthcare and in keeping healthcare spending growth under control. And we can only afford whatever redistribution we might want to do if we keep spending growth uh, under control through better payment incentives. Now, does that mean patients should just have fewer choices? I would argue that having the right choice architecture to, use, to, to borrow a term from psychology and behavioral economics matters a lot. That making it easy for patients to know this plan covers everything under the sun and has a really high premium. This plan has a lower premium and covers things that are deemed to be really effective medically, but doesn't cover things that are deemed to be not effective enough, where there's some, you know, nicely scientifically grounded definition of what those things are. Patients should have some choices about how much of their resources they want to devote to those different kinds of plans, and it shouldn't require them to have a medical degree. Your degree is lovely. Everyone, everyone's not going to have those degrees, and, and I agree absolutely that they should have the information they need to actually make choices guided by their providers once they actually get sick. That's a terrible time to expect people to make really nuanced choices about which hospital, which provider, and that's why providers being enlisted in that is crucial. Well, I disagree with this plan because maybe I misunderstood you, but... You don't think providers should help patients make choices? Well, that part I like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Which yeah. part didn't you like exactly? So many parts of it I didn't like, but the... <laughs> but the Where to start? Okay, the, the, what you seem to be saying is we want, maybe we want to think about a world where there's, say, two plans. Mm -hmm. One plan is the plan that covers, say, cancer treatments and a bunch of catastrophic things doesn't cover a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. The other one is like for people like me who just love healthcare, so it covers basically everything from acupuncture mm -hmm. all the way up to cancer treatments, right? If I, if I bought the, the sort of the stingy plan, the plan that only covers cancer, the day I got congestive heart failure, I'd want to switch. So and we would have to live in a world or a country which said you can't switch. So I, I want to draw a distinction between covering certain disease states or oh, not right, right. or technologies. covering the intensity. So think about something like reference pricing, not to get too much in the weeds about payment methodologies, but yeah. suppose you say, you know, let's pick our, our favorite uh, oh, technology. Yeah. Let's go for it. Let's Proton do it. Proton beam therapy, yeah. where you think, okay, patients with a certain kind of cancer, there are conventional treatments that are, you know, this effective at improving longevity, reducing symptoms, et cetera. There are technologies that are no more effective, but much, much more expensive, like proton beam therapy, which sounds great, but ends up you know, requiring you to build a cyclotron, <laughs> football field right. size thing, really expensive, no more effective. There should be an insurance plan that does not cover the cyclotron, where if you want to get that kind of care, you have to pay the extra out of pocket, and the really uncomfortable implication of that is that rich people are going to be able to get the cyclotron and poor people are not. And that is a, a really uncomfortable idea of two-tiered health systems for higher income people But what people if poor people lower. pick the proton and bankrupt themselves? That, I think that they should have that option. Okay. But I don't think that we can have our public programs pay for the cyclotron for everyone with taxpayer dollars when it's no more effective than the uh, conventional treatment. And, but that is a really uncomfortable debate to have and one that we haven't wrestled with adequately right, And that's the point that Gail made earlier, that we have to have a very difficult conversation about what these public dollars cover. They can't cover everything for everyone all the time. Yes, you have a question. Yes, thank you. My name is Diana. I'm also cr from across the river at the business school, so I'd like to use President Cosgrove of the Cleveland Clinic's uh, recommendation to get your comments on three things that he thinks are necessary to improve the healthcare system. Number one, metrics. Uh, when are we going to do more of what Kate suggested in terms of measuring outcome and results relative to dollars spent? Number two, uh, consumer accountability, whether it's alcohol, smoking, sugar, or exercise, when are we going to encourage through our policies and processes more 
consumer accountability as well as consumer choice. And number three, to the extent that the healthcare system has a lot of redundancies and duplications, uh, we talk a lot about financing and insurance, and we don't talk a lot about how do we improve the effectiveness and efficiency of our overbloated uh, health care system, which has got probably more health care providers at higher costs than we really need on a per capita basis. So, Gail, I'm going to ask you to answer the first and third questions, the one about metrics, because that's, I think, something that CMS has really been leading on, is the development of, of these metrics, and I want you to comment on how that, how that enterprise is coming along. But then also the last one, which is about introducing some sort of sense some sort of cost effectiveness into technologies like Proton or into very high cost drugs and our ability to do that. Um, I, I would be glad to. Uh, uh, do you want me to start with the, uh, the, the third one or go back to the first? The third one like was, a, well, there were, there's a three part a question. Cost so effectiveness. I'm gonna, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Cost um, effectiveness the, is the um, third one. The first one was right. metrics. Okay. Yeah, um, we clearly, need to be able to provide metrics. We're going to have to have an agreed upon set of metrics uh, as we start implementing the next round of physician payments under Medicare uh, called MACRA because we're going to have to determine which physicians uh, are worthy of receiving bonuses uh, and which physicians are going to be subject to penalties at least over uh, a number of years, not in the first few years. This is another area, like uh, my comment about the demos, where we have so many metrics that are floating around that it is making it extremely difficult for many physicians, their offices, uh, hospitals, although they hire people to do this, uh, to be able to cope with all of the metrics. It's time, again, to have a consolidated set of metrics a much more reduced number so that we can try to reduce the burden that we've been imposing, but actually have some metrics. It's a very important issue. Um, CMS has been leading. If you want to find out something about your hospital, go to Hospital Compare. If you want to find out something about your physicians, uh, it's limited now to groups of physicians. You can actually find out about your physicians. If you want to find out about nursing homes, uh, many of these, they're not terrific measures, but they're light years ahead of what's available uh, in most other, uh, by most other payers. Um, and we need to do better here. So it's one of these areas where it's time to pull back and instead of imposing three-digit numbers of metrics that people have to provide, depending on the payer, we have got to get to some consolidated form in terms of the metrics that we will use. Um, you know in terms of comparative effectiveness, uh, you are pushing one of my uh, hot <laughs> buttons. Uh, I think along with better incentives, some of which we were discussing tonight, both for the people providing services and the people using services. Uh, we need to have information about what works when, for whom, under what circumstances. This is not saying cost effectiveness, that's for the payer to worry about, but you can't make that determination if you don't know something yeah. about the effectiveness of different strategies that can be used in treating atrial fibrillation uh, or another medical condition, uh, knowing that people will vary and so specifying either by their characteristics or as we get more sophisticated, mm -hmm. uh, by their genomics or proteomics uh, or metabolic uh, systems so that we can begin to think about using some of the strategies we've talked about. Paying more for those things that seem to have a clinical impact, paying less for those things that don't. I'm a market-oriented economist. My view is don't say no, just make it more expensive, but allow people the freedom in principle uh, to be able to make those decisions. You can't do any of that 
if you don't have the information about what works when, and we don't, despite our three plus trillion dollars of spending. So we have time for one more question, and I see you standing up there on the, uh... oh, okay, excellent. Okay, terrific, I'm sorry. Um... It's very kind of you. Um, to an Australian, thanks so much. Um, my name's Amanda. We Rish know about you, yeah. <laughs> oh, there we are. Um, my name's Amanda Rishbeth. I'm in the Harvard uh, 2017 ALI program. And my question was really sort of following on from what you were talking there about what we know is if we just translated the available evidence, you know, across the board without doing any more research anywhere, yeah. we'd get phenomenal outcomes if that translation of that evidence was, was taken up. So my question is, the incentivization that you're planning within the reform, not on the provider side, as in the insurance providers, what are those incentives that you could really put in place to increase that translation to be a really significant step change uptake, rather than a choice of the proton versus you know, ABC cancer therapy? What other incentives could you pull to really drive a step change in that regard? So, uh, Avik, are you, uh, you, you know, you're the most excited about the ability of incentives to kind of change, reduce the cost of care, but in this particular case, to improve our health. Do you want to take that question? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, you know, and let me say again, the, when we talk about consumer-driven healthcare and having patients more in charge of their healthcare dollars, it's not a panacea. It's not something that happens overnight. Gail rightly pointed out that people who have health savings accounts today don't have as many opportunities as they ought to to shop for care where it's appropriate to shop for care because that's just not part of our tradition and our culture here in the United States. It's not part of the tradition in many uh, parts of, of the world that, uh, that have advanced healthcare systems. It is something that Singapore has done very well but and, and Switzerland to a lesser degree. But, but there's a range of, 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 of countries in which uh, consumer-driven healthcare has been utilized. So we can't just say, well, yes, if we, if, if we give consumers more choices magically, everything overnight is going to get fixed. There's a cultural change in the entire delivery of healthcare that has to take place. And over the way, along the way, we'll learn about where consumers, the leverage of consumer choice and consumer decisions can make the most impact and where maybe it won't have as much of an impact and where insurance companies and other third party payers have to play more of a role. So that's something that over time will evolve, but where we do need to go, we have two choices basically. We can go uh, the way the UK has gone or, or the Veterans Administration has gone, where all decision making is centralized uh, and the patient has less autonomy in how his health care dollars are spent. That's one approach to control costs and sometimes uh, have uh, more efficient delivery. Another way to do it is to have the patients in charge of those outcomes. And yes, sometimes they may, might, might make choices that Harvard or MIT or, or Princeton economists would disagree with, but that's, uh, that's okay. Sometimes what consumers want is actually uh, a better result than what, uh, than what people who seem to speak for their, or think that they speak for their behalf would want. So uh, broadly speaking, how do we get there? We get there by gradually moving to a system where more people are choosing the health insurance plan they want in exchange type format. It doesn't have to be magical thinking. You can fund more coverage for the poor by funding less coverage for the rich. And again, not just subsidizing the right people as opposed to the wrong people, but the right things as opposed to the wrong thing. We oversubsidize broad comprehensive insurance where we should be subsidizing coverage for really you get hit by a bus, you have cancer, you have a stroke. We're protecting you against catastrophic financial bills and creating a free market for those everyday services that don't really bust the bank. Thank you, Avik. And um, let, I'm just going to, we're going to wrap up this evening and we're going to stick around for some quick questions. Um, I'm just going to go around and ask the panel a very simple question. We're in February 2017. And we haven't talked about the politics of this. I mean, we were actually focused on alternatives, which is terrific. But I'm going to ask you each, just sort of based on everything you know about what's happening in Washington today, when do you think is the earliest that we might see some alternative legislation? Not a CBO score, but sort of a plan from someone in Congress saying, you know, here it is. This is what it's going to look like. So, Kate. Well, you're asking the wrong question to an economist. I have no idea what actual human beings you will ever do. Econ <laughs> <laughs> I cede my time to John. 
<laughs> well, you just have to, no, 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 I'm not going to let you go so easily. You know what's going on in Washington right now, so just give us a sense of the date. I'm not asking you what's in it, I'm just asking you for a date. In my crystal ball, yes, with in all your the crystal ponies ball. Yeah, in there. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. I, yeah. It is hard to imagine a major overhaul being in place anytime very soon. So I can understand paths by which you take down pieces that are existing yeah. on a short-term time horizon. It is really hard to imagine an alternative mm -hmm. market-based infrastructure set up in the next six months or right, probably right. longer. Yep, super, thank you. John. Yeah, I think, you know, um, I'm, I'm gonna I perhaps steal a bit of Ovik's thunder and say there are plans out there. Um, Ovik's got one, there are actually bills that are proposed, things like that. Uh, they're not, they're very far from actually being something you can implement. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, one, making the sausage is very complicated. Uh, and so I think if you ask, when are we gonna have actually a plan? I think the relevant context is, you know, CBO is a really important institution, mm -hmm. okay? They are the one truth teller left in Washington, okay? So the question is, when will there be a plan that CBO can score? When will there be legislative language? I think that it depends whether you go the repair route or the replace route. The repair route being we're not gonna repeal Obamacare. We're going to say, take, get rid of the individual mandate and replace it with, with right. some auto enrollment or with some subsidies to insurers or something like that. If you went that route, you could have something in six months. If you really want to go the replace route, which is they made a promise to voters they're going to repeal Obamacare before the end of March, which is the deadline they set, then I would, my best guess is 2019. Okay, great. Alvik, you have information that we probably don't have, but. Well, let me say, you know, one big difference between 2009 and 2017 is that Democrats actually had a pretty broad consensus in 2009, based on John Gruber's work in Massachusetts, of how they wanted to move forward with national health reform. There is no similar consensus on the Republican side. Republicans are united in what they're against. They're against Obamacare. Uh, there's a lot of diversity of views as to how, what they're for. Some people are for, like I am, a more market-based approach to universal coverage. Some just say repeal Obamacare and go home. Some are in the middle. And I think there's a 50-50 chance that they ever get to agreement on that. Um, it may be that there's no plan that 50 senators, Republican senators, let alone 60 Republican plus Democratic senators, can be a replacement to the UK. Uh, if they do come to an agreement, I think that we're looking at uh, the fall or the winter of this year. I don't think it's going to be any time soon. Because literally, there is nobody at Amitabh, there is nobody in Washington, not a President Trump, not Tom Price, not Paul Ryan, not Mitch McConnell. Nobody knows what uh, that plan will ultimately look like because the horse trading among Republicans is how to get to that agreement where a majority of Republicans are all on the same page. That work has barely begun. Okay. Gail, you have the last word. It um, as you probably know, in the last couple of weeks, we had two plans introduced uh, in the Senate, uh, one by Susan Collins and Bill Cassidy, with two other Republicans uh, in the Senate supporting it. Uh, it basically told states, uh, you can continue with the Affordable Care Act uh, if you want, uh, or you can take the money, or 95%, uh, of the money uh, would be available uh, and do something else uh, that is more suitable for uh, your population. Rand Paul had his uh, bill also introduced about uh, the same time. So the issue uh, Avuk has raised about when do you get a real consensus among Republicans and particularly uh, a plan that would be able to get some Democratic support, as, by the way, I think uh, the Cassidy-Collins uh, legislation uh, should. I don't know whether at this stage uh, it actually would. Uh, I doubt it will be before uh, the fall that that happens. But there are two different dates you have to distinguish. Mm -hmm. One is, when do they come together on legislation? And then you have to remember that there is going to probably be a two or three year implementation period when the new institutional structures uh, take place. 
if you think about the Medicare Modernization Act, the outpatient prescription drug, it was passed in 2003, went into effect in 2006. The Affordable Care Act was passed in uh, 2010. It didn't actually take its real effect until January of 2014. So we've got to distinguish between when we lay out, this is where we're going. I hope it would be a, a reform rather than literally a repeal or replace. That is a fundamentally political issue, uh, not an analytical issue. Whatever it's going to be a several year transition to the new world because it takes that long to put in place institutional changes. Thank you, Gail. That was really amazing. So here, we're done for the evening. Um, thank you all for coming. Here at the Kennedy School, we have a motto on our website on everything we do. We always say, ask what you can do. And I just wanted to thank the four individuals on the panel, Gail, Ovik, Kate, and John. I wanted to thank them for all that they've done for US healthcare reform. So thank you very much.